there's been concern for a number of months about Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP, uh, and their master bomb baker constantly updating their bombs to get past current sec security screening. Uh, there was a vulnerability discovered, I'm told by intelligence officials, in the last several weeks, and the, the uh, DHS was then directed to address that vulnerability, and that's what they're doing right now by enhancing uh, security at these airports. All right, just when you thought it was safe to maybe think about leaving your shoes on, sometimes when getting on a commercial airliner, Al-Qaeda has new ideas. And then we have another moment of hard truth when it comes to the battle in Iraq and what may be the toughest and most fierce battle that still lies ahead. Welcome into Midpoint, professor of law at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas, and director of the Center for Terrorism Law, also at that school, Jeffrey Atticott joins us today. Jeffrey, thank you so much for being here on Midpoint. Oh, my pleasure. Jeffrey, is it any shock whatsoever that we are now hearing that cell phones are going to be scrutinized by the TSA because apparently they want to make sure the batteries work, make sure that there's not a bomb in there. But isn't it really fair to say no shock because it's just another example of how Al Qaeda and the folks who are at work in Yemen specifically will just exploit every little thing they can to find a way to get to us again? Well, it is. It's a cat and mouse game. And uh, we've seen with airport security, when we get a specific threat from Al Qaeda, we tend to react to that. So, for example, you know, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, everybody takes their shoes off. The liquid attacks across the, um, you know, from uh, Europe to the United States, then we had the, uh, the, the bottle restrictions. So we're always reacting to what we think Al Qaeda is going to do or what they've done. You, you say we're always reacting, though. What about being proactive? because isn't it a little bit better and shouldn't our intelligence be keeping us a step ahead of the game? Well, you would think, and that's uh, we say here in Texas, you lean forward in the saddle, and uh, that costs money because, uh, you know, 9-11, for example, the 9-11 Commission said somebody should have thought about putting locking doors on the airplane so you can't get in and cut the pilot's throat. And, of course, they thought about it, but it cost $7,000 a door uh, to replace those doors so they didn't do it. So we're always in a reaction phase, but the truth is, that uh, you know, they're going to be get they're, they'll, they're they are going to be able to get through our security no matter what we do, because um, you know it's it's not a perfect world and uh, we don't want to spook the herd. TSA doesn't want to spook the herd, so we do these things. A lot of them are basically feel good because there are hundreds of ways that you can get through the current security. Uh, there are new types of uh, weapons that can be used that can be developed, and uh, there's only so much we can do. My general idea is stop them before they get to the airport. As you said, that's intelligence. I don't want to stop them at the airport. I want to stop them before they get to the airport, before they get to the Boston Marathon. All right. There you go. Let's start right there because you even just said the words, and I, and I wrote them down here. You wrote it. You said it was a feel-good. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the feel-goods don't do us any good when they actually come back and snap at us and kill people here. So knowing full well that we need to get away from the feel-goods, what needs to be done to stop this incessant... Uh, roses at the feet idea that everything's wonderful and we're we're actually finding who the terrorists are and what they're getting to us and actually doing something about it before we have to react like this yeah well that's that, that's intelligence we need intelligence but of course uh, we've had some glitches with our intelligence community uh, a lot of uh, critique about the nsa and what they're doing and how they gather intelligence so it's the balance between increased security and uh, the need for uh, uh you know privacy um but but again, our, our system at the ports, for example, really check about 95, about 5% of the uh, actual containers that come into the ports. We simply can't do it. Now, we could do a better job with the airline industry if we followed the Israeli model. And that is, they find out who is getting on that airplane, uh, you know, where you are. They do background checks long before people board that aircraft. They know who you are, where you're from, what you're doing. And then, of course, then they have uh, people that do the pat down and they have extra levels of security, and it works over there. Um, and so it can be done here, but it requires smarter, better, more resources, and, um, and, and so that's the issue. But we, like most humans, we react. We, we react to things. So if it hasn't happened yet, we're not going to do anything. There's two great words you just put in there, smarter and better. Americans always think we are smarter and better than everybody else, but we're not, are we? Well, relative to the rest of the world, Basically, we are stronger and better. Uh, the one exception being the Israelis, because they have to. They live in a stamp size, you know, postage stamp size nation, and everybody around them wants to kill them, uh, you know, 10 ways to Sunday. So they, they have to 
uh, engaged in that type of activity. But no, the U.S., uh, you know, we, we obviously lead the wor- world in technology. We've developed the Internet. We, we do all these things. Um, but, but again, we're dealing with a, pre- a bureaucracy, rather. And the TSA, as many people joke, it stands for thousands standing around. And uh, there are smarter ways to do it. Anytime you have a government agency that's involved in working things, as most people have kind of figured it out, uh, you have uh, you know you have problems, you have issues, and so perhaps privatization to some degree might be one of the solutions. Two things here come to mind immediately, and I think of Syria and Yemen, because certainly a lot of times we see where Al Qaeda bomb makers and certain people are coming out of. They are usually coming out of those regions. Do we need then to increase our intelligence in those regions? What could we do there? Because you properly mentioned the fact, try to get to them before they are actually getting to us here. So what could we be doing on the ground in those two countries? And are we doing enough, at least, to try and find out what's happening there at the source? Well, no, it's been a disaster. I mean, anybody that really has a, a clear view of what's happening in the Middle East knows that the, this administration has totally failed in terms of, of projecting our power over there to try to form some type of a pivot to increase our intelligence assets. We have been very unfriendly towards our best ally, which is Israel. Uh, Iraq was supposed to be an area where we could set up as a headquarters, so to speak, in the middle of the Middle East, uh, you know, a quasi-democracy where we could have cooperation, and, uh, and from there we could go out and, and, and kind of get some of this intelligence. But that's the total failure. Uh, President Obama pulled everything out of Iraq. We have no intelligence there anymore. Syria is a disaster. Libya, of course, is far worse now than it was under the dictator Gaddafi. Afghanistan is about ready to go back into the pit where it came from. So, no, Al Qaeda Central is on the rise, is growing, and uh, the jihadists that are inspired by this radical Islamic extremism, both here and abroad, are growing in numbers. It's a growing threat, and yet we still have our head in the sand, and we kind of wish it would go away. We don't want to address the issue, um, and that's part of the issue that, uh, that I find at fault with this administration. They simply don't take the threat seriously. They're schizophrenic when they do, and it's Band-Aid after Band-Aid, and nothing really is being done. Is it fair to say that after all those Band-Aids that have been placed on all of these intelligence needs over the years, that in places like Iraq and Iran, other places like this, the real trouble spots, but specifically when you look at what's happening in Iraq right now, all those band-aids have finally caught up to us that we simply and, and it, uh, you hate to say this but is it possible that we as an intelligence community and the intelligence community themselves have been so hamstrung that we really don't have a proper handle on what's going on over there at any given time no we don't and, and one example abu talib the underwear bomber 2009 christmas day he was going to blow up that plane over detroit his dad went to the state department yeah, the embassy there in Nigeria and said, hey, my son's radical Islamic extremist. You need to watch him. He was on a watch list. He didn't have proper credentials and he boarded the plane. No communication between the embassy and the FBI. Misspelled on his name. All sorts of disasters that, that allowed that attack almost to go off. The Boston attack, somebody had misspelled the name and so we didn't know that he went over to Russia to get the training and come back, even though he was on our list to watch. So we have human error. Obviously, we can't do a perfect job but a better job needs to be done in coordination that starts at the top. Um, the Obama administration at the very top has to really emphasize the danger, and yet they wish it away. Uh, here in Texas, the bond is workplace violence. Really, uh, you know, the number one threat facing the nation is not right-wing extremists, not left-wing extremists, or radical Islamic extremism. It's on the rise, it's growing, and we better take it more seriously. When you talk about it growing, I have about a minute, minute and a half left right here. Two girls in Britain tried to fly to Syria to join the ISIS fight, and the British authorities managed to stop them, uh, but they did apparently get away, and they did apparently wind up in Syria. We have a young lady in Colorado who is also found, who is going to head to help ISIS. Are we missing out on maybe one of the biggest issues here, that the next attack is going to come right here from young people like this because they're falling for this so easily? Well, of course it is. It, it already did. I mean, Boston, less, uh, about a year ago, we had young people engaging in jihad. So, yes, the threat is real, it's growing, and yet we are saddled with a virus of uh, political correctness. Nobody wants to admit that we have the problem. And the first step towards solving the problem is to admit that the problem exists. This administration almost never says radical Islamic extremism, particularly when in the context of homegrown jihadists. They simply wish it would go away. At the FBI Academy, for example, they have to vet 
information that they teach the agents to in the mob so they don't offend anybody's sensibilities. It's ridiculous. Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Atticutt, I want to thank you so much for giving us a couple of words here, but unfortunately I think it's going to make us all uh, sleep a little, bit, uh, a little bit lighter here at night. Uh, I thank you for your time. We will do this again, my friend. My pleasure. All right, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Atticott joining us. I do just want to correct this one story. The two girls in Britain, twin sisters, they did travel to Syria via Istanbul, join their brother in fighting with militants from ISIS. According to the media reports in Sunday in London, uh, the family was Somali origin, believed to have moved to Britain 10 years ago. Now they have gone back, and they have joined the fight against their own country and against freedom as well. Stick around. This is Midpoint, where every single day on the Newsmax TV network, we question everything.